Welcome to New Home Insights, the podcast from John Burns Research and Consulting. I'm your host, Dean Worley. If you want to follow market trends, demographics, capital, new ideas, and endeavors that touch on housing, we're going to try to make sense of that every couple of weeks. Let's go. Hi, everyone. This is Dean Worley with the New Home Insights podcast. As we discussed in a very recent podcast episode, we have a housing shortage here in the U.S., the lack of affordable housing is particularly acute. So one solution to this, or at least partially a solution, is ADUs, accessory dwelling units. And those are, I, you know, you probably know what they are, but think small houses that you can place on an existing lot or even sometimes attached to the main house. We have a company here with us that is looking to realize the promise of ADUs, and they're called Villa Homes. Villa Homes is, specializes in, you know, some, kind of these affordable, smaller ADUs, and they can sell them to homeowners, home renters, to builders, to to almost a whole cast of characters. We'll get into that. This ADU revolution, if that's what we can call it, is happening in a big way in California, but it's for sure not just California, and we'll talk about that as well. So with me to talk about this topic is Sean Roberts. He's the CEO of Villa Homes. Sean, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me. It's exciting to be here and to share a little bit about you know, what we see in the ADU market and what we're up to at Villa Homes. We're going to talk um, a fair amount about ADUs, then about Villa Homes. And then we'll talk about who are the users, who, who needs these, who wants these, where is the demand being derived from? First, though, let's learn a little bit more about you. Give us a little bit on your background as well as the background of Villa Homes. For sure. So I spent most of my career as a private equity investor focused on mostly real estate as well as some corporate things. And in 2018, I moved over to join uh, a company in the power buyer space where I spent the better part of uh, nearly five years working to build that company up from an early stage, uh, kind of following its series A round and scaled that business up and built a vertically integrated real estate brokerage, title company, mortgage company, and a whole lot of really interesting tech around that business. And Having been in that part of the housing resale market, it became really clear to me that the challenges around the housing market and the housing shortage and affordability issues that face the country are incredibly profound and absolutely worth tackling. And so I came on board to join the team here at Villa Homes earlier this year to really work on those challenges through the lens of you know, building ADUs and building prefabricated housing, which is the cheapest, fastest and frankly, also the most sustainable way to build housing, which we're really excited about. So um, that's a bit about my background. And Villa Homes itself is about two and a half, three years old at this point. So it's still an early company, kind of a series A startup. Um, we view the business as being really the next generation home building platform. And we're focused on building ADUs in California really as a wedge to build the business into a broader um, housing marketplace and platform over time. Yeah, California is really, I mean, it's not, it, ADUs have been around for a much longer time than I think a lot of people might think, but yeah. California has really made a big difference here with state laws being, making it almost impossible not to, per, to permit an ADU if you meet certain criteria. So let's start with that. Let's start with, first, let's, you know, let's go real basic here. Let's say, so other than my definition of a small home, what, what is your definition of an ADU? Yeah, well, there's lots of different interpretations of it. And generally, in my mind, they break down into three sort of broad categories. There are detached ADUs where you have an independent freestanding structure that is kind of the small house in the backyard. And that's what we focus on at Villa. In addition to that, you have attached ADUs where you're building an extension to an existing primary residence, which has its own entrance and kitchen and bedrooms. And, you know, it's a living space that is separate from the main residence. And then there's kind of another category of like converted other spaces. So converting a garage or another existing part of a home that can become an ADU. But generally, it's a self-contained living unit where you've got a kitchen, a bedroom, and some living space that can be locked off and separated from the primary residence and rented out or used by the primary residence um, owner in whatever way they think they want to use the space. So they're very and flexible that's a lot of use cases. That second category attached to the house, it, I've seen that sometimes called a junior ADU. Do you, do you hear yeah. that nomenclature a lot? Absolutely. It kind of varies by where you are in the country in terms of how people label them. Uh, if you also hear them referred to as granny flats or lan laneway yep. houses, or there's lots of different words for it. But we, you know, we kind of think about detached and attached ADUs, yeah. uh, with detached really being where, where we focus. Okay. 
Okay. And, and for the garage thing, uh, go ahead and get your permits. Stupid little, little <laughs> anecdote, but there, there was a house just down the block from us and they were clearly building out, building out their garage to be an ADU. And, and I live in California. And about a week later, they were tearing everything out that they had done. They did not go and get their, their permit. I'm assuming, I don't know. But, Permits uh, are important. Yeah. It's something we're very focused on at our company. <laughs> it's a very important pro- part of the process. So, so let's go just some basics for, for um, the California law. We don't want to be too California-centric here because this is a national phenomenon. But in California, it really has just gone nuts. And just some of the, you know, what is the California law? What, what is that? What are the key aspects of that? And how has it changed the game here? Yeah, well, this really started changing back in 2016 when the California state legislator start, legislature started passing a series of legislative motions that have really torn down the barriers to building ADUs, and they've done it top down. So from the state level, pushing um, the reduction of barriers to building ADUs down on the local uh, municipalities, which is a really effective way of driving policy change across the state. And that has been incredibly catalytic to driving the adoption of ADUs across the state. Like if you look at 2015, before these laws started getting passed, about 1,100 ADUs were permitted statewide. And if you look at the data for 2021, it was something a little over 23,000 ADUs were permitted. So that's like 20x growth. It's just and exponential growth. It's amazing. It's, it's massive. It's absolutely massive. And when you look at California, it's by far the most housing constrained market or the cities within California, the most housing constrained markets in the country, which I I believe your firm has actually published research on that not long ago. (laughs) And the state said, you know, depending on who you're listening to, the state of California needs to build somewhere between two and a half to three and a half million homes by the end of this decade. And if those homes are to be built in places where people really want to work and live, it's going to require densifying existing areas. And the best way to do that at an affordable price without really disrupting the existing look and feel of, of existing neighborhoods is through ADUs. So it's been an incredibly popular option for a lot of homeowners and increasingly now investors to want to participate in. And just to be clear, it's still not easy to build homes no. in California at no. all. But this is one area where the state government put its money where its mouth was and really and, and kind of played a game of whack-a-mole with local jurisdictions for after the initial legislation trying to find out clever ways to get around it. And they just popped them down and knocked them down and knocked them down until until you saw that exponential growth in permitting that we've very recently seen. Mm-hmm. So how about beyond California? Is it is it a little more, I mean, it's not top down. Is it more sort of bottom up? Is it happening? Is it percolating outward? It's a bit more, well, it's certainly more bottoms up based on different local jurisdictions passing local ordinances that are making this easier to do in different parts of the country. I think over time, the template that California has laid out, which is working really well, it's one of a few examples of you know, yeah. government legislation really driving real tangible change to the housing market, which is great to see. So we're optimistic that other states will see that and start to adopt part of the California model throughout other parts of the country. But there are a lot of other cities out there that have, you know, a pretty strong penetration of ADUs already um, with growth. Like Seattle is one market where it's about 1% of the single family housing stock that is currently attached to some kind of an ADU. And that's the, the ADU production in Seattle is up about 9x over the last decade. So huge growth there as well. Portland is something like 2% of single family homes have an ADU. Um, Denver is making a lot of policy, and the cities around Denver are making a lot of policy changes that are very favorable to ADUs. Austin, Texas is another one. And really the poster child market that we spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about here is Vancouver and British Columbia, Canada, where about a little more than a third of the housing stock has some kind of, uh, a, you know, they call them laneway houses there, but it's, it's an ADU. And that's a market that is incredibly land constrained and expensive where ADUs have been a phenomenal solution to housing in that market. And I think it's really set a template for other jurisdictions to follow over time. So it's still early, but we're seeing a lot of um, tailwinds behind the policies that historically have made ADUs kind of hard to build. And yeah. that's really starting to fall away, which is a good thing. Do you still see, though, the kind of, again, for lack of a better term, nimbyism, where a, a lot of the concern was from local neighbors thinking, oh, you're going to make our neighborhood too congested. Are you going to bring in people we may not want to be into our neighborhood? Do you still think that's a, is that a big hurdle still across the country? It, it, it varies by where 
where where you are. Um, and of course, like anything else, there's going to be different sentiment in the public that'll be for and against things like this. But I think generally, based on the surveys that we've seen done by various groups across California, generally ADUs are pretty well received and supported by the public. Um, of course, that's when it's conceptual and it's not in their yeah. backyard. And yeah. so when you get down to the hyper local level, you definitely have a little bit more pushback from the neighbors. But at the end of the day, this is the right thing for the housing market and the right thing for America to do to build more housing that can be owned or rented at an affordable price. And that's really important for us. This is probably an unfair question, Sean, but have you seen any states at all look like they make noise that they might do the California model for lack of a better, if that makes sense? I think Maine is one. Uh, it's a small market, obviously. But that's one state. Yeah. I've heard rumblings about New York maybe going in that direction. Okay. But um, candidly, we've had our head down focused on California because okay. there's so yeah. much to do there that we haven't really <laughs> dug deep on the policy uh, you know, landscape across other states just yet. But we're, yeah. we're turning our attention to it this year. I would guess Oregon and Washington, just because you have Portland yes. and Seattle being kind of ahead of the curve already. We'll see. They they certainly are too. Yeah. Okay. And, and apologies to our friends in Vancouver. I, I know you guys, okay, fine. You guys with your laneway homes, you started it. Absolutely. Fair enough. Congrats. Um, but yeah, but thank you. <laughs> thank you for, for exporting that to the South. So now let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about you and, and what you guys do. Villa Homes uh, you, you, you're the CEO of Villa Homes. It's kind of, kind of, uh, started up just this year, right? Yeah, just recently. And it was because I got to know the team and the investors behind the company, uh, late last year and just absolutely fell in love with the mission and the vision of the business. And the fact that this is a really clear and tangible way to have an impact on housing affordability and availability across the country. And our goal here is really to build the preeminent next generation home building platform by focusing on prefabricated housing. And that may take many forms, including HUD manufactured housing, you know, uh, modular, panelized, like lots of different ways to build things in a more cost effective and efficient and sustainable manner. But our goal is really to build the preeminent marketplace business that connects the demand of housing to the various factory suppliers of housing. And we started by Building ADUs in California is a great go-to-market wedge to profitably build a business around that concept. Uh, but we have pretty big vision to, to build this into a, a business that'll be in many more states than just California and, and likely product types that go beyond just ADUs, including scattered single family homes and other types of prefabricated housing over time. Let's start, let's start with ADUs. You're kind sure. of, I, I, tell me if I'm wrong, but you're bread and butter product at this point. Absolutely. It is. Yeah. Well, like, you know, give us the, the gist of how big are they typically? What's your typical size, even your typical cost range, if you can. Yeah. Well, typically our, our average price is somewhere in the f fully loaded, including the home and all the site work and subcontractors and everything. The fully loaded project cost average is somewhere in the three fifty to $400,000 range. And that's for, predominantly Northern California focused ADUs. So slightly higher cost markets where people are building a pretty nice spec product. The typical size that we build is just shy of a thousand square feet um, for an ADU, which is, which is big. And we do offer a variety of SKUs with different sizes of homes and different floor plans and configurations that the customer can choose from and also customize within. So we'll go down as small as a 550 square foot unit and we'll go up to 1200, 1300 square foot units as well. Um, but our, our goal really as a business is to provide the consumer with the widest selection of product types with the most customization to be able to fit the most ADU that they want to build in, in their backyard. Um, so that's what we're really focused on. How about the, so, okay, so the ADU is the core, but it sounds like you're quickly going to be doing a lot more than that. So this, this prefab, the way you build, tell us about that. How, how is that going to translate and expand from ADUs into a, a wider product array? Yeah. So to be really clear, we're not a factory. We don't manufacture the homes ourselves. We work with a variety of different suppliers across the industry and we essentially connect the consumer to the factory and we provide a lot of really important services that are necessary to bring into the equation to help the consumer actually complete a project. And so as we go forward, our manufacturers are able to build not just ADUs, but many other types of prefabricated housing that we know our consumers, and especially institutional capital that wants to work with us, wants to build. And the capabilities that we've built around 
permitting, entitlement, getting site work right, structural engineering, designing really attractive physical product that we're building through these manufacturers to our own custom specifications. All of that is part of the value add that Villa brings to the table. We make it easy for the end user to be able to come to us, engage with Villa in a modern tech forward way and f- discover the type of, now it's an ADU, but over time it could be a scattered site, single family home or other types of product and figure out what they can build, what they want to build, what they can afford and do that all in a really modern tech forward way where they can like literally design it on our website and choose all the oh, colors wow. and fixtures and finishes. And it's, it's really a user experience that's very similar to how you might expect to buy a car online, yeah. which is really cool. Um, and we think it's a, it's a really important part of being able to be a consumer brand in this category going forward. Cause like houses are kind of one of the last things that you can't really buy on the internet in the same way as you can other <laughs> consumer products. So will you be able to like, say, say you're the, 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 I don't know, standard the most common, which is a homeowner who now in California can put three more up to three more residential units on his or her lot. Will you actually sort of match the, you know, the elevation to look the style of yes. that main house? Absolutely. That's really important. And getting the aesthetic exterior to be consistent with the primary residence is something that our customers care a lot about. And it's something that we care a lot about too. Like we want a physically attractive unit that's in the yard that looks like the main residence. And we're able to skin the houses with different types of material and different colors to be able to match the primary residence as best possible. And it, it, they look really good. So we're pretty happy about that. That's great. How, how do you differ from other type of off-site construction? Are you basically just a type of off-site construction? Um, in some ways, yes. I mean, we view ourselves as the connection point between the consumer and the factory. And what that means is we can offer the, again, the widest selection of choice at the best pricing with the fastest speed to deliver to the consumer. And doing that again, all through like a modern tech forward interface allows the consumer to engage with us and figure out what they want to build in a really intuitive way. But I think the thing that really differentiates us right now is we are the leading builder in California of ADUs. I'm not aware of anyone that's done more projects than us at this point. We've sold more than 500, we've completed more than 200, and we've built across almost all jurisdictions in California where someone would actually want to build an ADU. So we have the local knowledge and sophistication and data to be able to cost and price projects really accurately. And we understand how to navigate the local jurisdictions from a permitting perspective And that helps us get our customers through the journey of building an ADU with a lot of confidence that they're working with a company like Villa that can actually get the job done. Um, And uh, that's a really important thing to have, you know, the scale and the track record to build the homes well. So so you're holding their hand, you're getting them through the permitting process too? Absolutely. We actually, we self-perform permitting internally. So we, we're not a factory. We don't build the home. We design the homes and we tell the factories what to build. Uh, okay. We're not a general, well, we technically are a general contractor, but most of the labor in terms of, you know, actually installing the home and doing the finish work and the site work is all outsourced to various contractors that we work with who are great. Um, but the part of the value chain that we really focus on doing internally and self-performing is permitting because it's complicated and hard. Yeah. And the more you do it and the more reps you get in across different jurisdictions to really understand what their parameters are and what you can and can't build and how to get permits approved in a way that works really well for the local jurisdiction and for the customer is really important. And so that's a center of excellence that we've really focused on investing in and building out as a kind of a, a really important capability for us. And apparently it can be a, a complex as our apparently our neighbor found out recently. Yeah. <laughs> are there any, are there major drawbacks? Like I've heard somebody said, oh, well, you know, don't forget ADUs have to be independently plumbed and there's some cost factors there. Are, are, what are the, I, the biggest drawbacks or the concerns with folks who are looking at you to get an ADU? Well, we help them work through all that. So in terms of all the site work and utilities and the other infrastructure that needs to go in place to build it, we work through all that with the customer in our pre-construction phase. So we're, you know, we're helping guide them through that and navigating it and coordinating with the different um, design and engineering parties that need to be involved in getting that right. And we have an understanding of what needs to be done, how much it's going to cost. And we're very transparent with the customer about that upfront, which is important. So they know what to expect in the project. And one of the advantages of how we build is because it's prefab, 
it's like a one day installation. You crane the box into the backyard and you're pretty close to done. There's a little bit of finish work and maybe some site work that needs to be done before and after that. But the construction timeline is very, very quick, which makes it particularly nice for someone who's living in their primary residence to not have a one or two year long stick built construction project in their backyard. Yeah. So yeah. the speed and the lack of disruption is another big part of what we do. And we find that to be really resonant with our customers as well. So let's talk about the, who uses them, where, where are they, what niches are they filling? Just to be clear, these can be for rent. You can rent them out. You can sell them as, as a, a second unit. I mean, is that is you can sell ADUs typically independently, can't you? Can you even sell them when you, the main homeowner, still has the main home? Yes, there's sort of an emerging regime around being able to separate the ADU from the main residence in California that's pretty technical. Um, but yeah. we are starting to see some of the groundwork being laid to be able to, to do that and separate them in a really interesting way. So we'll see where that goes over time. I think it's still pretty yeah. early to see how that develops and also how how things will be valued and, and trade okay. in the market, but we'll see. And, and appraise too. Are there, any, yeah. are, are there issues with appraisals? I would, I would guess for that too. That, that'll shake out, but I guess we're at the inception of this, aren't we? It's still, it's early, it's early innings in this category with a lot of things to be figured out. Um, and that is, that is one. And like the, the policy framework around it is there. The market still needs to figure out what that means and how it's going to take advantage of that over time. And we'll, we'll see what the market does. Are your users, are, are they, I don't know, this is it's a terrible question, but do you think, are they mostly going to rent them? Or are they very frequently using them like, like for the office? I mean, they're phenomenal for a home office. They're so sequestered. Are the oldest kid or is just a, a, a array of uses? Yeah, it's not a terrible question at all. It's a good one. Um, and so in terms of our consumer business, we see a mix of all different types of use cases. It could be everything from a home office, as you mentioned, a separate space for the, you know, the in-laws or the grandparents who may stay there full time or part time. It may be someone that wants, you know, Pilates studio. It may be someone that wants a pool house. It may be someone that more importantly wants to generate income out of that unit by either renting it on a long term basis or potentially on a short term basis by putting it onto, you know, one of the short term rental marketplaces. And so there's a lot of different reasons that the consumer would want to build this type of unit. And ultimately it creates value for the property too. Like this is, you're creating more square footage for your home, which is uh, pretty attractive for a lot of folks, particularly when they're locked into their primary residence at a really low mortgage rate. If you need yeah. more space, this is an interesting way to do it rather than going and buying a bigger house at a really expensive mortgage rate today. So we're, we're finding a little bit of that coming in as well on the consumer side. Yeah. Yeah, the classic golden handcuffs of your 2.9% mortgage rate that will <laughs> never be a thing again in all likelihood. So let's let's talk a couple of ways of, of how they add value. Let's do rental first and then homeowner. Is yep. there a sense, there's almost like a rule of thumb. If you are going to rent this, do you have, a, I mean, is there a rule of thumb of, of how much value they add? Or, or if you're, um, say, a single family residential operator, you now have two units instead of one. Is there like a... That you know, that's a hundred and fifty percent of the total rental value of that lot, or something like that. Any kind of rule for that? Yeah, it's every like everything in housing, especially when you're dealing with existing homes. Everything is incredibly idiosyncratic, and every deal is its own unique yeah. snowflake. What we have seen from a sort of invest, with putting our investor hat on, um, we've looked at underwriting a, a pipeline of several potential acquisition opportunities where we would buy the primary residence, which in California is kind of a I don't know three and a half, three and three quarter cap kind of game these days. But by putting an ADU in the backyard, what we found is we can generate stabilized cap rates in the kind of high fives to low six cap rate range, which is, we think, a pretty interesting return profile to be owning really high quality single family residential rental properties in California. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. And a lot of investors are seeing that potential. And we're seeing that potential, too. We're actually raising some capital around that strategy ourselves right now to go and do it um, because we've seen some of our clients do really well with uh, that type of acquire and develop and generate a really interesting yield profile by renting both the primary residence and the ADU together. Let's let's come back in a second, Sean, to the SFR mm -hmm. and ADU equation. Let's let's um, first though, I want I want to not forget the homeowner issue. Yep. Is there also kind of a rule of thumb? Okay, you have your single home, it's worth X. And, and now you're going to build an ADU, 800 square feet. It's your home is now worth X plus Y. Is there kind of a, a sense of that? It, 
again, it's so idiosyncratic that I'm not sure I've got a great rule of thumb for that because it also depends on the size of the ADU relative to the primary residence, the level of fixture and finish that's going into the ADU. Like there's a lot of factors that go into it. It's certainly adding value and it's adding material value, certainly relative to the cost of the ADU. Um, but every project is is going to be different. So I, I, I don't want to anchor folks to the, the wrong kind of rule of thumb there because everything is so different. I also feel like it might widen your potential buyer pool because you now include folks who need that for a use, home office, extra kid, in-laws, but also see that as a moneymaker, as, as a profit, as a rental center to defray their mortgage cost. Absolutely. And we're seeing some buyers look at it through exactly that lens, which is a really interesting way to, you know, generate some yield to do exactly what you're saying, which is, you know, offset the cost of the mortgage on the primary residence, which is in this environment, incredibly attractive to a lot of folks. And it can be a gateway to getting into home ownership that they couldn't otherwise access. Yeah. Especially in California, where you are for for now, because that's where we all know what home values are in California. So let's talk about who the other folks you're looking at. So the single family residential developers or even just just mom and pop purchasers or even midsize purchasers are, are they a big part of your client bases they're they're putting them on that lot and they're they now have two units to rent yeah it's a it's a big segment for us it's grown in terms of its share of our total mix quite a bit in the last few months and it's an area that we're really focused on developing even more this year and it goes from everything from yep the mom and pop in, you know, individual investor that's buying maybe one or two rental properties to do this on to smaller groups that have portfolios of a few dozen homes, to even the bigger institutions at this point that are finding this to be a really interesting way to deploy capital, especially in an environment where acquiring the standalone primary single family home really doesn't pencil in today's capital markets. But if you put an ADU behind it, the math yeah. radically changes and it starts to make California SFR something that can be really unlocked to wow. institutional yeah. investors. But you need the capability to actually build the ADU and build yeah. it quickly and know what you're doing. And so it's something that capital theoretically has an appetite for, but actually accessing that with a partner that can do it at scale is something that you know, I think we're pretty uniquely suited to do that at Villa, um, which we're, you know, we're spending a lot of time kind of building that out this year. I won't ask you to give anything away or, or name any names, yeah. but are you working with some of the bigger institutional folks in that space potentially? Yes. <laughs> so <Okay>. um, <laughs> I, I, I won't name names, but I can say that Please. there are you know large multi-billion dollar publicly traded companies that have a pretty keen interest in doing this, which makes sense. Like if you're an asset manager at one of these big companies and you can't really do new acquisitions of new properties that are accretive to your FFO profile, um, but you've got capital to put to work and a capex budget to spend. <laughs> Putting an ADU adjacent to an existing asset at a low teens yield on cost is pretty darn attractive to a lot of these folks. And we're finding that there's pretty voracious demand to build ADUs around existing both single family homes and multifamily properties. Yeah. That has been really, really, frankly, a stronger demand channel than I than I expected. You mentioned that to me. So you actually can potentially put ADUs in an existing normal class A apartment complex. And you'll, you'll if they have some space that is usable, you'll, you can throw put some ADUs in there. And they just ma- you know magically increase their rent roll. Yeah. Yeah. We just completed a project last month for one, one of those big publicly traded companies that yeah. had a hundred unit low rise multifamily property. And it had excess land, a little bit too much parking. And they concluded that between the two buildings they already had, putting two ADU units in was aesthetically consistent with the property, but it allowed them to add two more units to the rent roll. And doing so at a pretty interesting yield on cost made a lot of sense to them. And that group in particular is keen to do a lot more with us. And we're seeing others come in now that we've demonstrated the ability to do that. And I think we're the first, at least I to my knowledge, I think we're the first group that's actually got an ADU permitted and built on a multifamily property in California. So it's a new thing that we're really excited to to look at how we can densify even further existing multifamily properties over time. Yeah. I, I have a few that I should um, mention to you because we do a lot of apartment studies here and usually it's in urban areas and, you know, obviously parking is at a premium, but we often do in outlying areas or suburban areas. And it's, it's really surprising sometimes how some of these large apartment complexes just have mass parking and it's yeah. like, no, we don't need it at all. There's plenty of parking. No one's concerned about parking. No one will pay for parking. That, those types of complexes are ripe for this kind of ADU. 
enhancement. We agree, and they, they seem to see it that way too. So we're excited about what can be done there. How about build to rent in the format? Are you going to be doing that? Are you look, seeing that as an opportunity to essentially, again, you have these build to rent communities that was going to go all single family detached, and now all of a sudden it could be, at least some of them can be a two for one on that lot. Yeah, well, we're seeing demand from there as well. And some of the build to rent players that are out there building new communities have already set up the communities with the right legal infrastructure and permitting to be able to allow ADUs to be built in those developments. And from their perspective, it's, you know, it's additional yield, uh, which is really interesting. And it allows them to densify and really maximize the yield they can get out of the land that they're building on. So that for us is a more nascent channel, but one that we're exploring and spending a lot of time with different players throughout California doing build to rent developments and thinking about ways that we can work with them to help provide an ADU solution for what they're building. Let's talk, let's wind this down with the future as I I'm, I'm want to do on this podcast. Let's first talk about, let's start with California, but may, then maybe expand there. I'm gonna ask you sort of to just give me a feel in terms of market size. I mean, I think this is big, this feels big, but how big is big. Uh, you mentioned a minute ago some of the uh, the permitting uh, for the state. Can you recap that and then just give me a sense of how big do you think this grows over the next few years? Yeah, it's a great question. And the data that's out there around the total size of the ADU market, both in California and nationally, is incredibly bad. <laughs> like No one has really good <laughs> clean data. And I, I hope John Byrne starts to study it and put some more uh, structure <laughs> around how we track the metrics here. But from our, our assessment of the California permit data, which again went from about 1,100 permits a year in 2015, the laws changed. In 2021, it was a little over 23,000 permits that were pulled for ADUs. Like that's a huge growth in terms of the permitting. But when we look at the market from our lens, which is looking at detached like standalone ADUs, the way that we cut the data is to basically assume that half of the ADU permits are going to detached ADUs. And we know the majority of California ADUs are detached. We don't really have the exact mix. So we kind of assume half the permits are detached. Then we assume that about 80% of those permits will pull through to be completed projects. And we assume a roughly $300,000 average product or average project price which includes the home, the site work, all the subcontractors, it's sort of the fully loaded price. And if you kind of multiply that all out, it implies roughly a $5 billion total addressable market for AD, detached ADUs in California this year. And when we look at trending that out over the course of the rest of the decade and getting to reasonable kind of really low single digit penetration rates of all single family homes and a little bit of yeah. penetration, but pretty low across multifamily throughout California, we see this growing to roughly a $10 billion a year industry by 2030. So between now and the end of the decade, it's something a little more than $60 billion of ADUs, just detached ADUs, just in California will be built. And that, from our perspective, is a really exciting and really great yeah. thing and a great market to be building a business in. And going beyond California, assuming other jurisdictions continue to sort of follow suit, the market is just going to continue to grow exponentially into other jurisdictions over time. So we're really excited about the market potential here. Do you see that being fast or slow? Again, unfair question alert. Do you see that being fast or slow outside California? Is the kind of thing where you can just kind of hit that critical mass and all of a sudden the zeitgeist says go and you start seeing other states, let alone large cities, adopt these kind of policies? It's a great question. I mean, historically, people would look at California and assume it's a really hard place to build things and change laws <laughs> to be able to yeah. do this type of thing. And they've done it. And it would have been, you know, if they weren't the leading state on this, I would assume they'd be one of the last. Uh, so, you know, we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll see. Um, there are a lot of other jurisdictions out there where it's a lot easier to build and a lot easier to change policy around yeah. this. So, I think it's going to be a really, really interesting category for the rest of the decade. And yeah. I think it's certainly going to vary city by city, state by state uh, for ADUs. Um, but, you know, there's a lot more tailwinds than headwinds behind this. And yeah. when you think about the needs of building more affordable and more available housing in the places that people want it, the densification of existing cities through ADUs is really the best way to do that. And so, you know, I'm excited about where this is going to go in the years to come. Yeah. Logically, it seems like it's going to be in those locations where it's chronically undersupplied or, and difficult to get supply. So maybe it does hit last those places where that's a lot easier. You know, your, your, your Texas, yep. Florida, Carolinas, but any place that's ur urban, 
are where has a history of being a little bit anti-development those seems like the places where it can hit it's just the is there gonna be the political will to make that happen yeah what we're seeing i mean austin texas has a pretty good tailwind behind yeah. this you know north carolina's got some interesting laws around this as well so there are places that uh, are you know high price them. markets then right because austin yes. texas especially for texas is a very high price market so maybe that's the, also another denominator okay absolutely yeah this thing and with this, Sean, how about for, for you guys and you guys at Villa Homes? I mean, you're, you're in California in a big way. Where are you heading to next? Well, we're going to get bigger in California. So okay. we just launched our uh, San Diego market earlier this month, which we're really excited about. So we are actively marketing and looking for customers in San Diego, which we're thrilled to be building houses down there in Southern California. We've already done some projects in Southern California, but we're really making a dedicated effort to launch in, in San Diego right now. The bulk of 2023 is going to be focused on California for us, really deepening in the markets that we're in, really honing the operational machine and starting to work at looking at uh, building the business out to a few other places. You know, our short list is something that's kind of evolving as we think more about it and we see where the demand is sort of pulling us to. But Austin, Texas is high on the list. Denver is high on the list. Uh, North Carolina is high on the list. The Pacific Northwest is high on the list. So a lot of places where this can work, um, but we're really focused on go deep, not broad. And we want to, you know, not stretch ourselves too thin and go too quickly. And we want to do it really, really well and having the right supplier base in terms of factories and subcontractors, the right local knowledge around permitting, the right data to be able to price everything accurately. Like these are all capabilities that you need to get really in the weeds and deep in a market to really nail. So we're going to do it slowly and methodically, um, although it may look really quick to some of the folks on the outside, but uh, really slowly <laughs> and methodically to kind of go to the right places in the right sequencing over the next couple of years. But we're excited to bring yeah. Bill outside of California. I, I like that. It's more, it's more, don't throw a bunch of darts, but really study that dartboard and then be judicious about it. Yep. Makes sense. Sean, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing some time about Villa Homes with us. It was my pleasure. And it's always fun to talk about ADUs and housing and prefab and Villa. So I, uh, I loved it. Thank you for having me on. It was fun. Absolutely. This is Dean Worley for the New Home Insights Podcast. Thanks a lot for listening. We will see you again in a couple of weeks.